Hi, this is Kara from the Special Needs Mom podcast. And this is Angela from Especially Organized, Sensible Solutions for Special Needs Moms. We have this heart for special needs moms. And so we thought, you know what, let's combine forces. And we have come up with what we're calling the purge party. And you can pretty much guess what it is. It's a party where we're going to come together and we're going to purge or in general, accomplish a goal, a small goal together. So we have set this for January 27th, starting at eight o'clock for my Pacific Coast people. Which means 11 o'clock for all of you on the East Coast. So this is an opportunity. If you have something on your to-do list that has just been stuck there and you are wanting to move it up on the list, you're wanting to tackle, maybe it's a space or an area of your home or a category in your home that has just needed a little time and attention. This is your opportunity for you to be online with us while you work and have access for us to help you answer your questions, help guide you and just serve you for those two hours. Yeah, exactly. And I think you can tell like what we've designed is just this very high level of support for that project that you just haven't been able to tackle on your own. The thing that we are envisioning is that you get to leave this purge party feeling so accomplished because you did the thing, you started the year off getting that thing done that you you were stuck on last year. And so it's a momentum builder, if you will. You can go ahead and sign up. We have a link ready for you. And we are offering this for $40 for the whole experience. Absolutely. And we hope you'll join us. I think it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a great group of moms of special needs kids. So we all get each other. We all have an understanding of what it's like to have something on our to-do list, but just we haven't been able to tackle it yet. So I hope that you will join us. We're super excited to bring this to you and we are thrilled to work with you. All right. We'll see you all there. Hi, I'm Kara, life coach, wife, and mom to four incredible and unique children. It wasn't all that long ago that my son received a diagnosis that had my world come crashing down. I lacked the ability to see past the circumstances, which felt impossible, and the dreams I once had for my life and family felt destroyed. Fast forward past many years of surviving and not at all thriving, and you'll see a mom who trusts that she can handle anything that comes her way and has access to the power and confidence that once felt so lacking. I created the Special Needs Mom podcast to create connection and community with moms who find themselves going trapped and with no one who really understands. My intention is to spark the flare of possibility in your own life and rekindle your ability to dream. This isn't a podcast about your special needs child. This is a podcast about you. If you are a mom who feels anxious, alone, or stuck, then you are in the right place. Welcome. Hello and welcome to the Special Needs Mom Podcast. So good to be with you. And I've just finished recording a conversation with Erica Kingsbury. And Erica is somebody that I have gotten to know over the last, we'll round up to a year. And it feels like a privilege. And I asked her to come on to the show for a couple of reasons. One, I think she has, of course, a unique story to share. And I wanted her to be able to share that on the podcast and asked her to come on to the show for a variety of reasons, one of which she's a mom just like us, and she has a unique and valuable story to share. And I find that she shares very openly and vulnerably. And those are the kind of guests that really are my ideal person for this podcast. And also, you'll hear in the episode that Erica is what we would call an alumni of the Pathway to Peace coaching program. So we do talk a lot about that. She gets to share her experience and was very intentional of having her talk a little bit about that right before the fall cohort opens. And so you can hear her talk about it. She shares some good advice and What I hope that you'll take from this is if you find yourself thinking, maybe, or I wonder if, that you'll consider reaching out. We have the fall cohort of Pathway to Peace starting up. I feel like back to school is this special time for moms where it's kind of like our new year. It's a time where we think, okay, we made it through that season. What's next? And I'm going to be 
different <laughs> once my kids go back to school. And I think that we're coming off of a season that in many ways for many of us is pretty exhausting and I'll use the word depleting. And so it's a time where we're rebuilding and I would say also rediscovering. So it's a perfect time to consider like, hey, maybe being part of a coaching community and, and program would be a good fit for what I want for my life. Let me tell you a little bit more about Erica. So Erica lives in a super rural town up in Washington. And she shares a little bit about that and her experience of that in our episode. She's a stay-at-home mom, and she's like many of you. She never anticipated being a stay-at-home mom. She was very career-driven and very happy in her career, but it shifted for her. She's right in the middle of those years where her son, Jack, is developing on his own pace and going to kindergarten this year. And the gap between her son and some of his peers is just really starting to show. And she shares about that. And what you'll get from this conversation is uh, kind of an exploration of what it was like to get Jack's diagnosis and not knowing what was going on and then knowing what was going on and the role of grief and how she in particular grieved. You're going to get to hear from a mom that I think you're really going to relate to on so many levels. All right. Let's welcome Erica. Erica, I'm very excited for this conversation. I'm excited to finally have you on the show. Welcome to the Special Needs Mom Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, let's tell everybody who you are. I know you a little bit better than I know most of my guests, and we'll tell people about the history in a little bit, but give us a little picture, day in the life, a little bit about the becoming of you to where you find yourself today. Well, I am a stay-at-home mom of three. Um, My oldest is seven, going into second grade, and my middle one is five, going into kindergarten, which is a big milestone for us. And then my youngest is one. And so I have been a stay-at-home mom since my oldest was about one years old. I did not intend to be a stay-at-home mom, never saw that for me, but it was just something that I felt led to do. And we used to live in a kind of a big city, and then we decided to move to my hometown when my oldest was little. And so that's where we're at now. And it's such a blessing to be surrounded by family. When we had my son, Jack, who we're going to talk about, he was difficult as an infant, and it led to a lot of questions about him. There was something there that we couldn't quite put our finger on. And eventually what that led to was finding out that he has a very rare genetic syndrome. that's always been there. We just didn't know it. In fact, we didn't get that official diagnosis until he was three. The first time we heard the term William syndrome, which is what he has, he was about two and a half. And so for those first two and a half years, we really had no idea what it was about him. There was feeding issues. Um, He's very colicky. There was delays. There was, he wasn't meeting milestones. There's a lot of different things that we just weren't quite sure what it all meant. And so it took us a while to get there. So we've known that for two years now, officially that he has William syndrome and it's definitely altered our lives in lots of good ways and lots of challenging ways. And I was driving him back and forth to preschool all the time and came across your podcast. And I mean, as we'll get into it, here I am now. (laughs) Here you are now. Definitely. I'm curious if you look back at the time, like where he was requiring you to attend to him differently than your older son, and you knew something was different, but you didn't know what it was. I'm kind of picturing that it was a challenging time. And I'm curious if you look back now, like, what do you remember about that time? I remember a lot. It's like it's ingrained into my brain. Some of the challenges that we faced when we brought him home from the hospital it didn't take long for him to start getting really fussy. And those first six months, he just screamed all the time, cried all the time. Nothing I did really soothed him. Looking back, I wish we had known because there's things that I think we could have done a little bit differently. There's things we could have even helped him with. One of the things with Williams syndrome is that they can have a high level of calcium in their blood, which can be painful, physically painful Mm -hmm. for them. I could have eliminated that from his diet and that may have helped. And I didn't know that. So what really stands out to me is just how challenging it was, to be honest with you. I never expected, I was that naive 
oh, one kid's not that bad. Let's have two. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not that that's true for everybody, but it was just such a challenge. The day-to-day stuff was so hard. We couldn't really go anywhere. Traveling with him was really difficult. And I mentioned that we live in a really small town. We live quite far away from grocery stores doctors, all the stuff. And so to travel with him was a nightmare because he would start crying within 20 minutes of the drive. And it takes us like an hour to get there. And so just the day-to-day stuff and even the big stuff, not being able to attend certain things because we knew he would just cry the whole time. It just kind of felt like all of a sudden our life was just wrapped around this crying baby. That was really difficult in a lot of ways to manage. And it was hard having a toddler at the same time. And you know, trying to be there for him, but feeling like, how do I handle both? How do I handle this? That's what stands out in my mind the most during those early months, that first year is how we just wanted to figure out. I took him everywhere. I took him to chiropractor. I tried all the different things and nothing really worked. And I heard a lot of people saying, oh, with colicky babies, it just takes time. You'll wake up one day and (laughs) and they'll be better (laughs) and it'll stop. And I just thought every day is going to be the day. And it wasn't. We lived with it. We learned how to integrate it into our lives as best we could. Yeah. I just think about in my own journey, as you're describing this, like wanting, like knowing something is awry, knowing your child has a need and yet not knowing how to help them. And that's kind of where I'm at with some of Levi's challenges is that I know that there is something that is asking for attention and yet even with all of my trying and all the resources I have, I haven't been able to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard place. It's a hard place to be. Yeah. I felt that way so many times during those first two and a half years, knowing that there was something, I just couldn't figure out what it was. And once we found out what it was, it was so obvious, but I just didn't know enough about it. And it wasn't until somebody brought it to our attention that knew more about it and had heard of it before that it was ever something we would have ever considered. I thought it was something else entirely. It was never on my radar that this is what it could be. And I just looked at him and thought, he's going to grow out of this. We're going to get beyond this. We're going to do feeding therapy. We're going to do speech therapy. We're going to do all the things he might get some extra assistance. And then one day he'll catch up to his peers. And then one day he'll grow up and move out of the house and get married and give me grandkids. Just like, you know, like I had this huge (laughs) picture painted for him. Then when I did find out what it was, it was, it was crushing because a lot of those things may not happen for him or would be very, very challenging for him. So for a long time, just not knowing was hard. Yeah. Well, let's turn and look at that chapter, if you will, of when you did learn about the actual diagnosis. So like there's the freedom because like, oh my gosh, now I know how to help him. And the word you used is crushing, which I feel like is such a powerful word and very accurate to what it feels like when you have the knowledge all of a sudden of what your child's facing and what that potentially means. So if you will bring us back to that experience and how you experienced the news, or I should say the impact of some of the harder parts of his syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. It was my birthday. We were out to dinner with one of the, he was, I had actually referred him to this birth to three program that's available in our state to any child that qualifies. And he qualified for a lot of different reasons. He presented with global delays. And so he was getting different services, but this was during COVID time, Mm -hmm. you know, so it was all Mm -hmm. online. And Mm -hmm. so we didn't really interact with the people face-to-face, but one of the, she was like the coordinator. I can't remember her job title, but she and I got to know each other pretty well because we talked all the time we ended up meeting up with her for my birthday. It was really fun to see her and meet her in person. And she and I had been talking regularly about Jack and somebody had recommended that we get him tested for autism. And I thought, I don't think that's it, but we didn't know what else to do. And she said, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, if it's not, it's not, but it might open some other doors. Somebody might look at him and say, well, this is what it is. And we thought, okay, that's fine. But that's like in our, in our area, that was a year and a half wait to mm. even see anybody for that. But he was young, thought, well, we'll do it. 
we'll just wait and maybe something else will come up. And when we saw her for that dinner and she got to interact with him in person, I asked her before we left, do you think it's autism? Because none of us do. And she said, no, it's not, but I do know what it is. And I don't want to tell you. (laughs) I said, well, you can't say that. You can't do that. It's my birthday. You owe it to me. You never do that to a friend. You never say I have some really important news, but I can't tell you. Uh So she told me and she said, it's, I believe he has Williams syndrome. You know, have you ever heard of it? And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, no, I've never heard of that. But what does that mean? And on the way home, I, of course, dove into Google and began to realize this is it. I mean, just looking at the pictures of other kids, because with Williams syndrome, you're missing several chromosomes. Your facial features are very specific and people with Williams syndrome all have very similar characteristics. So when I was looking at these images on my phone, I just couldn't believe that they looked just like my son. And since he was born, nobody really knew who he looked like. We all just kind of said, oh, well, he's just his own person. He just looks like himself because he did not favor Craig or I, my husband, Craig. I couldn't believe it sitting in that car on the way home. I was immediately grieving. I was devastated because what I started reading was that this is a mental disability. It's developmental disability. There's complicated health issues that they can have. This is innate to who they are. It's it's not something that's going to go away as I had previously thought. I can't take him to speech therapy or feeding therapy or any other kind of therapy and, and it's not going to go away. And I began reading of adults who may not live on their own or really have a life like you and I would have a life. And those things were just devastating. I felt completely shattered because it was in one moment an entire vision that I'd had for my family, for him, for my two boys to grow up together was gone just in an instant. And it was that relief that you talked about, but bigger than that in that moment was that crushing grief of everything you thought you knew is gone. It was a very difficult time for me Mm -hmm. during those first weeks. Yeah. I mean, I think so many of us really resonate and relate to your story and have our own variation of it, of where we feel like we perhaps gain some facts about our child, but those facts also opened up a life that really we never would want for anybody. Maybe not everybody says that, but I can wholeheartedly say that um, if I could free my son of the challenges that he has had with his disabilities, I would in an instant even though, yes, they have brought good things as well. So now that was right around two years ago. So you had the immediate impact in your experience with that instant grief. How have you settled in to what I call the evolving grief of being a special needs mom? Well, I learned that it's a cycle and I learned that it comes back. (laughs) I, (laughs) I very naively stated to a friend of mine, couple months after he got the diagnosis, I feel great. I feel like I'm at peace with it. You know, I've accepted it. And she very gently, lovingly said, well, just remember that you may not always feel that way. And it's okay if you don't. And she was right. There's been a lot of things to grieve. I think you grieve initially, and then there's more grieving because there's more things that come up. And right now, his disability is more obvious to us than it ever has been because when he was a toddler, a lot of things that he was doing were not that much different than other toddlers, but those toddlers have since grown up and now they're acting like five-year-olds and Jack is not acting like a five-year-old. His disability is more and more obvious within our home when we Mm -hmm. go to public places in every part of life, it is more obvious. So there's so many new things to grief. Things like seeing the relationship between my oldest son and then him and seeing how my oldest son kind of has to parent him to be able to play with him or how my oldest can go off and play with a kid that's the same age as Jack and they can play seamlessly, but yet he can't do that at home. Those are things that are hard to see as a parent. I grieve that. I've learned to accept grief a lot more 
and I've learned to recognize it. And I'm more like, all right, let's grieve. Let's do this because it's necessary and it's real. And it doesn't mean that I'm not a good mom or don't love my son. It's just that it is what it is. And I just welcome it and then let it go when I'm ready to let it go. And I also try not to wallow in it. (laughs) I've learned, you know, healthy coping mechanisms along the way. And I do attribute a lot of that to your coaching program. That's helped me through a lot of that. Yeah. But it's a cycle. Well, definitely. Well, let's maybe jump into talking a little bit about the coaching program. Yes, you are alumni status, if you will, of the Pathway to Peace coaching program. And I'm curious if you look now, having completed the whole cycle, what had you reach out and what had you say, yeah, I think I want to explore this coaching thing. So yeah, when I decided to reach out to you, I was in a place where I had been working on myself. I had been going to therapy, um, doing a lot of, just a lot of work on myself. And I felt like I was ready for something a little bit more specific to me as a mom with the child, the disability. I just felt like I wanted to get more specific coaching in that way. And so it was really kind of what I was looking for. And I had been listening to your podcast for a while. We did two years of developmental preschool with Jack. And that was a lot of driving on my behalf. Somewhere in an Instagram post, I have the exact number of miles. It was a lot. I did the math when I was done with the two years and it was a lot of mm-hmm. miles. And it's like two straight weeks of driving or something. I can't remember. Okay, so it was like two hours each way, right? Am I remembering yeah, this so right? We, so when he started the preschool, he was three and it was just two days a week. And it was just in the mornings. So we live an hour away from the preschool. So we'd drive down. I did most of the driving. My husband did some, and then my parents helped me out too every once in a while. An hour down, I basically sat around and waited for him. Or I I was pregnant with my youngest. So Mm -hmm. I would go to a doctor's appointment sometimes. And then I would go pick him up and come home two days a week. Well, then last year, as a four-year-old, he did three full days a week. And there's no way I was going to sit down there for an entire day with an infant and wait for him. So I would drive down. So it's an hour down, an hour back. Mm -hmm. And then a couple hours later, an hour down, an hour back. So it's four hours of driving a day, three days a week for this last year. I want everybody that is like, their jaws dropped right now. I think, wow, that's incredible. I want you to think about the things that you do that other people would look at. They would be like, holy macaroni. (laughs) (laughs) So I want you to identify that. And I just want you to like acknowledge yourself and give yourself a pat on the shoulder because I feel like it's a demonstration of how deep we dig for our kids. And I think it's a beautiful testament of our love. Okay. So as you were saying. Well, thank you, Kara. I appreciate you saying that too. So yeah, I had been driving and now you all know I was driving a lot (laughs) and the radio just gets a little boring after a while. So I started listening to podcasts. It just kind of became my thing and it gave me something to look forward to. Cause you know, getting in that car and sitting for those long hours, is just sometimes you don't want to get back in the car. It's like, I have to do this, but I don't want to. So podcasts became something for me to look forward to. And so I started listening, you know, more and more to you and you had talked about it in an episode, I think. And then I was also, you know, following you on Instagram. I just had this like quick gut feeling. And I'm a big believer in like listening to what your heart is tugging you towards. When we hesitate, excuses get in our way. And, you know, oh, I don't have time for that. Or I don't, I don't have the money for that. And I'm so glad that I didn't listen to any excuses. And I just reached out. I don't even remember what I did. Reached out to or clicked a link or something. I don't know. But the next thing I knew, I'm talking to you on the phone and I'm signing up for the program. And it was truly such a gift. It was a gift I gave to myself to be able to get that coaching. I felt that it was something for me, but it really benefited not just myself, my entire family. Mm -hmm. So it was an incredible opportunity for me. That is great to hear. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) What was it like, you know, because I don't think if I recall correctly, I don't think you had worked with a a coach before you mentioned you had worked with a therapist. I want to give people like a little behind the scenes. What was the experience of being coached like for you? Well, first of all, it was extremely 
comforting to know that you knew what it was like to walk in my shoes. Even if your son and my son don't have the same, you know, really anything, it was just comforting to know that you knew what my dark days felt like, what it was like to feel the way that we sometimes feel as moms, special needs moms, like you get it. And so that was comforting. And then the other thing is it was such a wonderful thing to be able to literally come as I was to the the coaching calls that we had. I mean, I was nursing my daughter a lot of times I was, you know, dealing with kids in the background and it just felt like I didn't have to pretend anything, you know, just here I am. This is the mess I am today, or maybe I am put together today. Uh, That didn't happen very often, but it was just nice to come as I was and feel welcomed and valued and just being able to soak it up for that hour. And the other thing I will say, so I wasn't always coached every day. So in the program, you know, there's, I can't remember how many of there were when I was going through, but not everybody gets coached every single day. And honestly, the days when I wasn't being coached, I still took away so much from whatever that other mom was bringing up and saying, you know, here's my coaching request today. It was just so valuable to listen to her struggles and to how you coach her through that. There was still so much to take away. So even if I wasn't getting coached that day, I still had a lot. It still provided a ton of value to me in those coaching sessions. And then all the other resources that you have and the community that we have with that, just a really wonderful resource. I'm so glad to hear that. That you loved it because I mean, I pour my heart and soul into the program and, you know, it's the coaching, it's the content, it's the community. I'm going to say it's pretty robust and you took advantage of it all. You did all this coaching. Now, looking back, I think you joined in December. So it's been, you know, we're coming up on a year since you had made the decision. What do you feel like you perhaps walked away with? Or like, what do you feel like it was the net result of you taking on Pathway to Peace? I think the biggest shift for me was feeling more empowered and I think more comfortable in my own skin as a special needs mom. I thought about this a lot and I don't know if you feel this way or not, but I feel like the mom that I was before the diagnosis is not the mom that I am now. And I feel like in those early, in that diagnosis, something shattered. I've picked up the pieces, but it's, it's not the same. The pieces are maybe even different. And I feel like that's very hard. I felt pretty confident as a mom and then everything changed. And I had to kind of relearn who I am and how I'm going to do this and what it looks like. And there's a lot of things that I feel like I've had to just kind of let go of because they don't work for us anymore they don't serve us. It's not going to happen that way. And sometimes it's really hard because it can be very overwhelming and isolating to feel like you've, your world's been rocked and your kids need you more than ever. But how do you do that? How do you show up and be the mom that you can? And I think that I've heard this before and people will say, I couldn't do what you do or things like you're the right mom for him. And, you know, it wasn't a mistake that God chose you to be Jack's mom. And sometimes I think, well, I don't know what I'm doing. So how is that true? Um, <laughs> and I beg to differ. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm like, but none of this is easy and nothing really makes sense. And I don't know if I'm doing it right. And I feel like what your coaching program gave to me was more empowerment and who I am as a mom and stepping into this role, even though it was, you know, almost two years or yeah, a year, two years after the, we found out about William syndrome, even though it was a delayed reaction, it was like, I needed that. I needed to feel confident again as a mom. I needed to feel like I could do this even on the hard days. And I feel like this was a critical piece of that. And I do feel more empowered in my own family to make decisions and choices based on what I want for us and what I want for Jack. I think a big shift in my perspective was just kind of feeling kind of like a newer version of myself, if that makes sense. I just feel more comfortable now than I used to. 
Mm, Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And there's so much to celebrate and all the things that you accomplished. One of the things that has been fun to watch, obviously, you, you know, you had a great experience coaching and you chose to take a break. And I just want to highlight as like, I think even when you talked about it, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is actually a manifestation of all the work that you did in coaching is that you trusted yourself enough to know exactly what you needed. And what you needed during this season, this more recent season is to not have the commitment of coaching. And so I just think it was really beautiful to watch and in kind of a weird way, like a graduate, <laughs> a graduation <laughs> gift <laughs> is not what it was, but uh, I don't yeah. know, it was really fun over here to watch. Oh yeah. You gave us the, you know, the option for the summer and we wanted to receive some coaching or not over the summer. Cause I basically graduated like right as the summer was, was starting. And I really think that if I hadn't gone through your coaching program, like I would have said, well, I should do that. Of course mm-hmm. I should do mm-hmm. that. I'm supposed mm-hmm. to do that. And it's a good thing. You know, how, how, why would I say no? And like I, going back to what I said about feeling more empowered in this new role that I have as Jack's mom and then mom to my other kids too. And also wanting to take charge of my own peace and protect that is I knew that I needed to have more of an empty plate this summer. Coming out of two years of driving Jack back and forth to preschool the last summer before, you know, kindergarten, I knew I needed to just chill. And Mm -hmm. it was, it was truly what I needed. I felt very content in that choice. I felt really good about it. We talked about things like that before, and I've heard other people talk about things like that before. And what was so wonderful about it was your response to me was, you know, what you were really, I think, proud of me for doing that. And the interesting thing about it is, I don't think I've told you this yet, but I'm a person that a lot of times has struggled with seeking validation from others. And in that moment, when I chose to do this for myself, I didn't need your validation. I didn't need it from you. I didn't need to hear you say, good job, Erica. I'm glad you're listening to yourself. I didn't need that. And so that was another thing going back to your coaching program that really helps me as a mom like us, we have to make a lot of choices and we have to do Mm -hmm. a lot of things different Mm -hmm. than other moms or other people. And it doesn't always make sense. And it's hard when you tend to be a people pleaser or seeking validation, because then you feel like you're kind of going against, you know, your natural way. You're failing everywhere. Yes. <laughs> yes. So to be at peace with that yeah. was, it felt really good for me mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Yes. I'll highlight what you said, knowing yourself and what you needed and choosing, which coaching is simply said as awareness and choice and action. Like that's the basic foundation of what it is. And so I just think, oh, that's really cool. The word that's really sticking out is the word shattered, how, you know, you described, you know, your life, your expectations, all the things being shattered and that you've built it back. It's not the same, but you've built it back. And I know that your faith is a big part of your life. And my guess, my prediction is that there has been a big impact to your faith as a result of this shatteredness. And if you're willing, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what it was like in your faith relationship, your relationship with God to have the experience of the diagnosis. You're right. It did have an impact. And interestingly enough, the way where I'm at right now with my relationship with God is not where it was with the diagnosis because I was angry. And a part of feeling shattered was feeling angry that this was happening, that this was what we had, you know, this was it. Like, why do we have to, I never imagined. I don't think that most people that go through what we go through with our child receiving a diagnosis ever imagined that that would be their case. Most of us have heard or read of the poem, the Holland. Holland yeah. uh, welcome to Holland. I don't think welcome that's Welcome to Holland. When none of us sign up for Holland, you know, we don't go into it thinking we're headed there. 
And so when that happens, it's normal to feel angry and to be frustrated and sad and to grieve what you're not getting to do. And I felt that way for a while. And I've been a Christian my whole life. I was raised in a Christian home. To make a long story short, Jack's diagnosis did feel like a wedge between Mm -hmm. me and the Lord and even me and my husband. And it was hard because I was grieving so much and I was so devastated. But over time, it has pulled me into a deeper, more intimate relationship with God than I've actually ever known before. And it gives me so much peace on a regular basis. I really love turning to the Bible and learning about God's character when I'm struggling, because there's so much of that on display. And if we just go look for it. And one verse that has stuck out to me is Psalm 139. It's written by King David, who was a deeply flawed man, but who loved the Lord and and was a man after his own heart and had a wonderful relationship with him. And one of my favorite passages is that one, Psalm 139, where he's talking about how God knows us so well and knows everything and is sovereign over every part of our lives. And to me, as a woman of faith, that gives me such peace because sometimes it's isolating, isn't it? We feel lonely because I don't actually know most of my friends of, that are moms that have kids with disabilities. They don't live here. I mean, most of them are just internet friends and everybody has their own lives and people are busy. And so when you're really struggling, sometimes you struggle in secret. People don't know. And the thing that brings me peace is that God knows. He Mm -hmm. knows everything and that he can meet my needs in ways that other people can't. Because if we're constantly expecting other people to meet our needs, we'll be disappointed. My faith now is so much stronger and more intimate than it's ever been. And I am super grateful for that. And I am so glad that I have that going through this. I want to share just a really, really quick story. And it's a good testament to how the Lord meets your needs. Earlier in the summer, the beginning of summer, my entire family was sick. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. like so unfair to start the summer being sick. And I mean, (laughs) sick, sick, like a respiratory illness and the flu. And so it was just horrible. And I was the last person to get it. So Mm -hmm. I spent like, you know, a week and a half taking care of everybody. And then I got Mm -hmm. sick and I was exhausted. And Mm -hmm. there was one evening I had the kids had all gotten it, but they were pretty sick. I had been up night after night with one kid or another. When you have three, it just, you know, never ends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then all of a sudden my husband starts to go downhill. Like he and I were kind of tag teaming and now he's out. And so I'm just like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) how am I going to do this? I just needed a moment to myself. I was like, I need to get some emotions out. I can feel it like bubbling. And so I got all the kids to bed and my husband was like, you know, laying on the couch. And I said, I'm just going to go outside for a minute. I'll be right back. And where we live, we have like no neighbors. We live like out in the middle of nowhere. We're in a very rural area. And so I just started walking and Earlier that day, I had been feeling just like so burnt out and just like, I need to go cry. Like, I just, you know, you just need to get that out. And I just felt this tug on my heart. Like I felt God saying to me, meet me outside. And so I just took off outside for a little walk, walked across the yard into the grass by our house. And if you walk far enough, you can walk. It it was about, I don't know, sunset. And so you can walk out and see the sun setting if you go far enough. So I just kept walking and I just felt the tears coming and I just felt the emotions rising. And I was like, all right, God, I'm going to come out here and I'm just going to cry. And that's what, that's why I need to come out here. And as soon as I hit that sunset, I stopped and the most perfect peace filled me. And it was not that I was meant to go out there and cry. I was meant to go out there and just feel this incredible peace that I needed. I needed that so badly. And that to me is a testament to what God can do in your life is meeting your needs in a way that nobody else can, because he knows you better than anybody else. And so that's a little part of how faith is a big part of my life and what it has done for me as a mom. Thank you so much for sharing that. And even just the visualization of you 
stepping outside for you connecting with God and your own emotions in that way and having that gift. Yeah. Ultimately that piece. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's where I'm at now in my faith is there's a lot of questions. There always will be. Um, We don't have all the answers here on earth, but knowing that God is so sovereign over it all gives me a lot of peace. I can see how that Psalm in particular speaks to you. You know, you speak about the lonely piece and how, you know, we're not forgotten. I think that that, if I look back through my journey of faith, it's been like, uh, hello, I'm over here. (laughs) Please help Mm -hmm. me. And so the experience of feeling forgotten and kind of recovering the trust that you're not. So uh, yeah. thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. As we move a little bit towards wrapping up, I'm curious as to what's next for you. I know you'll only have one little baby at home next year. You'll have your two oldest in school. So your life's going to look a lot different. What are the things you're dreaming of or hoping for that are coming up for you? Well, something I've thought about a lot. and. To be honest with you, I have so many things I want to do. I've always loved writing. I started a blog back when like blogs were the thing. And maybe they still are. I've always loved to write. My oldest was born prematurely. And so when I started motherhood, it was pretty rocky because that was a tough situation too. And I turned to writing then to be able to express how I was feeling. And I looked to other moms that had had a similar experience, read their blogs to relate to them. And so I've always loved to communicate and express myself through writing and talking and just generally sharing. And so as I have more time, I would love to be able to pour more into those creative outlets and really would love to pour into the community of special needs parenting and in my own way, whatever that might look like. And I love to connect with others in that way. Those are some of the things that I think about is using the things that I already love to do, the different gifts that I have to help others and do something really meaningful with that. So I don't know what that looks like yet, but it's it's fun to think about. And we'll see if uh, I'm right now, my daughter is the queen of a short nap. And so (laughs) we'll see if she gives me any time, but I am looking forward to just having one in the house and being able to do some things for myself. I think that's really important is to not quit dreaming of what we want. Even when you have a child that is, I mean, Jack is a joy. My gosh, he is a light in our lives, but yes, he is challenging. He's a lot of extra work. It's a lot of things. And it's, I think it's important to not lose sight of yourself and what you might want to do. And that will look different for everybody, of course, but it's important to me. And I hope to be able to do more of that someday soon. And I look forward to seeing you continuing to bloom and flourish and to kind of sprinkle those gifts over all that you touch. Thank you so much for being a guest here. And thank you for being a part of my life in a way that, you know, I get to serve. And so that's for me, kind of living out the experience that you're describing, like it's the greatest joy that I have. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kara, for everything that you do for me and for a lot of others. And I really appreciate the work that you do. It's very important, it's meaningful. And I'm glad that you're doing it because I feel like you're paving a way for others like me and then others that can benefit from what you bring and the wisdom and all the things that you, that you do. So I I appreciate you and I appreciate being on here. Thank you for inviting me. And this has been really fun to chat with you. Definitely. And where can people go connect with you on the socials if they want to be acquainted? I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram. My handle is leggings and littles. And that's where I'm at. Okay, <laughs> and I love following you because I get to see this rural community that's so different than my own. And it is beautiful. I've seen it with my own eyes through a screen. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the it's... truth these days. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll see y'all on the next episode. One more thing before we officially, officially wrap up this show. Sometimes when I'm listening to podcasts, I have the experience of wanting more. I'm listening at the very end thinking, I sure wish that episode didn't end. 
I invite you, if you feel in any way the same way, I invite you to the Special Needs Mom podcast community, which is a free group that I host on Facebook, where we as a community of fellow moms who listen to this podcast and are experiencing life in similar shoes, get to talk to one another, get to share stories, get to actually interact. I hope you'll consider joining. See you over there.